Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for the miracle of your word to be open to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Bring encouragement, strength, anointing to us in the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 40, and I'm titling this, titling this, Comfort, Comfort My People. And that's not my idea, that's God's idea. He wants to bring comfort. Now, the book of Isaiah can be divided into two halves. The first half is the book of judgment. It goes from chapter 1 to chapter 39. The second half is the book of comfort. It goes from 40 to 66. And really, there's judgment on both halves, but there's a lot of judgment in the first half. But there's also tremendous blessings in both parts. That word comfort is an amazing word. In fact, the prophet Nahum, that's really in Hebrew, that's what his name means, comfort, Nahum. So the fact that we could have a book of comfort in the middle of the chaos of this world, and I think we have some chaos in this world, don't we? In the midst of that, we can have God's comfort. And the word comfort is probably spoken or written probably over a dozen times in chapters 40 through 66 in the book of Isaiah. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. That her sin has been paid for. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. And the rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now verse 6, a voice says, cry out. And I said, I asked, well, what should I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers. The flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Verse 9. You who bring good tidings to Zion, you uh, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up and do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. And we end with verse 11 like this. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. And he gently leads those that have young. What a grace message we have. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. God has his people. And there's a lot of history of God's people. It started with Abraham. We can go from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. The 12 tribes come from Israel. God isolated them down into Egypt for a couple hundred years, a few hundred years, so they could grow to several million and then exited them out of Egypt and brought them to the promised land. All this happened in real-time history. They got to the promised land and something interesting happened. The people begged for a king. We want a king. We want to be like all the other nations around us. You can read a very interesting section in 1 Samuel 8, where God tells them, listen, if you want a king, this king's going to wreck you. Remember, Samuel is upset about this. And the whole chapter in 1 Samuel 8 talks about what this rotten kings, what they're going to do to you. But the people just want to be natural, normal. We still want a king. So God told Samuel, let him have a king. Saul was the first king. He did not do well at all. David was the second king. He did a lot better. He was able to repent. A lot of good things happened through David, but he still had his faults. Then Solomon came after David, and he fell so bad that God says, I'm going to split the kingdom of Israel in two. And he waited until 1 Kings 11. If you read 1 Kings 11, you'll see all about that. So after Solomon, God did divide the nation of Israel into half, the northern half, the ten tribes to the north, called Israel, then the two tribes to the south, Judah and Benjamin, which would be then called Judah. There was no good kings at all in the north. Brought 20 kings, practically. And 722 then, God let Assyria come down and take the 10 tribes away and just clear it out that the northern section of Israel. They're gone. So Isaiah is prophesying during this time. And <clears throat> about 150 years later, 
They had some good kings that were doing the good thing, and they lasted a little longer, Judah. But about 586 B.C., the Babylonians came down and just emptied the land. Took, the, took them captive up to Babylon. That's so prophetic. Two very important things happened. One is the land was empty for 70 years. Very important. And then the other thing is there would be no more kings. They're done with. So, uh, you know, what they did is they, they, they would not honor the Lord with the Sabbath year. Every seven years, the land was to, to rest. But that is so impossible to do. Yet it was prophetically pointing ahead to another rest. Well, they didn't give the land the rest. So after about 409 years, the land was owed 70 years of rest. The land will get its Sabbath rest. So how prophetic is this? It points ahead to the Messiah who will be our Sabbath rest. Rest. In the Old Testament, whenever anyone messed with God's prophetic prefigurations of the Messiah, they got into a lot of trouble. You don't mess with the Sabbath rest because it points ahead to the Messiah. The second thing is there, there would be no more kings until the king of kings comes. God wants to be king. And I always like to say the Old Testament prophecy leads to New Testament joy. God will fulfill and we, all these promises in the Old Testament so in the midst of all this horror, in the midst of all this chaos, God brings good news, good news. And he announces it in advance through Isaiah. And he brings really an impossible message, except God can do things that are impossible. All things are possible with God. So Isaiah then 40 verse 1, comfort my people, says your God. How could, would, should God proclaim comfort? In the midst of this chaos. Well, here's the reason. There's really three kinds of covenants, and you could call them contracts. The first covenant is between equals. People are equal. The other kind of a covenant or a contract is a king to the servant. The servants will get all the blessings from the king as long as they do what the king says. But if they don't, they're going to be cursed. There'll be a curse upon them, the king's servant. The other covenant is just a royal grant, where the king says, I'm going to grant you this no matter what. So really, we have an example of the king-servant covenant in Genesis chapter 2, where God put Adam and Eve under a covenant, stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they disobeyed, and they broke that covenant. And then the other covenant would be with Moses in the Exodus. There's a king-servant. These are king-servant's covenant. If you don't keep the covenant, there'll be a curse upon you. But then there's another covenant given to Abraham. You can read it in Genesis 12. It is a royal grant. There's no way to fail when you agree with this covenant. Nothing but success. So this royal grant covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12, you can read the first four verses. It's very beautiful. Seven little promises. And the last one is this. The whole world, Abraham, will be blessed through you. And we know that's the promise of the Messiah. And, and uh, you could follow this unbreakable link of this covenant all through the Old Testament. And it weaves its way through. And it's all about Jesus, the Messiah. So again, Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort my people says your God. You are my people. I am your God despite failure. And he's showing it right here. Then in verse 2, it says this, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Literally, it, it means in Hebrew, it means speak to their heart. The word heart is used. I wish I would have left it in the, the translation, but speak to their heart. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sins, all her sins. Something miraculous is being proclaimed here. It's God's people pay double for their sins. It's a way of saying it's all paid for. It's done. When God puts it in writing, it's secure. We, we, we can announce, it can be announced 100 years ahead of time because it's a miracle. And I want to look, at, I wasn't going to do this, but I just want to look at 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, the, the books, uh, First and Second Chronicles are written after kings, and it's a repetition of the, of the history of Israel with the kings. And by the time you get to 2 Chronicles, there's, uh, the last chapter, chapter 36, there's, there's no more kings. And the, uh, Babylon has already captured the people, and he's explaining this. But I love the prophetic link, which leads to the book of Ezra, right here in, let's see, verse uh, 20. Second Chronicles 36, verse 20. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar carried into exile uh, the Babylonian remnant, you know, carried them up into Babylon, who escaped from the sword. In other words, they're still alive. And they became servants to him 
and to his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. Now it would be King Cyrus of Persia. Now in verse 22, it says this, the land enjoyed its Sabbath rests. It rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Several places in Jeremiah, Jeremiah speaks about this. Then in verse, uh, verse 22, it says this, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in, the or in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm, and he put it in writing. And this is what the king Cyrus says. The Lord, he's using that I am, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, this is a foreign king, by the way. This is an amazing miracle of providence of God. The Lord, the God of heaven and earth, has given me the kingdoms of, of heaven and earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him in Jerusalem, in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Let him go up to Jerusalem. He freed all the people. And, and he's even going to you read later, he even pays for it all and helps it happen. That is a miracle. You can read in this uh, section in Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 29. You can read it in Isaiah 44, Daniel 9, Zechariah 1. God will raise up the king, king Cyrus of Persia to free the captives of Babylon and, and bring the people back. I call it a Cyrus miracle. I love, love that miracle of Cyrus. It's a miracle of grace. And it points ahead to the Messiah, God's providence. So back to Isaiah 40, verse 3, a voice of one calling. So really, you can, this is amazing. 400 years, there would be silence after the last king. They're allowed to trickle back into to Judah and rebuild the temple and whatnot. And they didn't hear from God for 400 years. Can you imagine how long that would be? No prophets, nothing. Maybe, you know, they've, it's just amazing. So can you imagine they're just well, I guess we'll never hear from God again. All of a sudden, God speaks in the middle of that silence. 400 years, he breaks the silence with his plan of salvation. And it says this in verse 3 in Isaiah 40. A voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. I want to look at Matthew chapter 3 where we actually see that happening. There's so many different places at the beginning. We can read about this in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But look at Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who has spoken through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Now, verse 4 says something interesting. John... John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. It's a way of saying right here, we can't read everything, but it's basically saying he is going to be so separated from this world, he won't even wear the worldly clothes, and he will not wear, wear any food prepared by humans. He's totally separated, and we'll learn what that means more. Now, in Luke chapter 1, uh, Luke almost spends a whole chapter about John the Baptist, and we get a lot of background, and his birth... John the Baptist's birth was a miracle planned ahead of time, and, and he'll, he will prepare the way for the Messiah. Now, the priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, they had no children. They were barren. It was impossible for them. And all of a sudden, an angel visits them and says, you're going to have a child. <clears throat> they didn't quite understand it. And we'll read uh, Luke chapter 1, and we'll just see what this angel tells Zechariah. Verse uh, 11, Luke 1, 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense, you know, in the tabernacle. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will never take wine or any other fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel he will bring back to the Lord their God. Verse 17, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, the prophet Elijah. He'll be like a prophet. In 
to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteousness to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That is his ministry. We can go on and read all, all the way to verse 80 in chapter 1 of Luke. It says, And the child grew up and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. In other words, as soon as he's old enough, maybe 13, 12, 13, whenever the age was, he left his home and was totally separate because God had had him separated out. And really what that is is a Nazarite vow. You can read in Numbers chapter 6. It's a, the whole chapter is about that Nazarite vow. Netzer, Netzer in Hebrew means separate. If you want to take a vow of separation to the Lord, then he gives a whole list of things you must do, and they're radical. You, you can't drink wine. You can't even eat grapes. You can't even eat the skin of a grape. Now, once you're through, they did, of course you can, but, but during those times, whether it's a week, whether it's a month, you are separate. It's a Nazarite vow. John was born with that vow. God had him separated out. It was a miracle. And he's getting people ready for the Messiah. Now, if we go to Luke chapter 3, we'll get a little, little more insight into this. Luke 3, verse 15. The people are hearing John. They haven't heard from the Lord for 400 years. Now the John's coming and stuff is happening. And just, just one little instance here in Luke chapter 3, verse 15. Now, the people were waiting expectantly and were, were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ, the Messiah. Well, John answered them, I baptize you with the water, but one is more powerful than I will come, whose thongs on whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. In other words, he's going to bring a harvest of souls. But he will he'll burn up the chaff and with unquenchable fire. Now, verse 18 says this. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and he preached the good news to them. So back to Isaiah then, chapter 40, verse 4. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. John is leveling the ground so all can see the Messiah. Then verse 5 says this, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, when Jesus first entered this world, it, you know, it was not that public. It was pretty private, and it was hidden on purpose. Joseph and Mary knew about it. Some angels knew about it. Maybe a few shepherds. That's it. But when the time came and the time is right, there's no way he's going to be hidden. The Messiah is open for all. All will see him. So John the Baptist's calling, his only calling, was to get people ready for Jesus. Once they saw him, then he would kind of disappear off. Let's look at what John chapter 1. John the Apostle writes about this. John the Baptist. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God. He's pointing right to Jesus, who takes away the sin of the world. This is John the Baptist showing people what, what God has sent, the Messiah. The, then he says this in verse 30. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was so that he might be revealed to Israel. Remember when he, Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down upon him. Now we know he's the anointed one, the Messiah, the Meshach. Verse 32, then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain he, who will, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Verse 34 then, I have seen and I testify. This is John's job, his calling from birth, before birth, 400 years of silence. Now John calls out to the people. I have seen, I testify that this is the Son of God. And he points them to Jesus. John's ministry is over, basically. So we have God's grace, God's provision. How about God's assurance? Isaiah 40, verse 6 says this. A voice says, cry out. And I said, well, what shall I cry? 
I want to let the Apostle Peter explain it a little bit. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Here's what Peter says. Talking to believers who have received this Jesus and been born again. Here's what he tells them. Verse 22 in 1 Peter 1. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. In other words, you're pure now. You're sinless in Christ. You've obeyed the gospel. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you may have sincere love for your brothers and love for one another deeply with your heart. For you have been born again, not with perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Then he quotes Isaiah 40. All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. That preaching has been going on for 2,000 years, and it's still bringing a harvest. What a harvest. All believers have accepted the word of God, just like John is saying, or Peter is saying. In God's word is Jesus Christ. He's the living word. And what we have will endure forever. How is that for a holy assurance policy? We have it in Christ. This natural world has no assurance policy like this at all. It's going to dry up and wither away like dry grass, like weeds. Now, I grew up in East El Cajon. I lived there in the 50s. We lived there. There is not much out there. And we lived at the foot of Rattlesnake Mountain. That was my playground. And one of the beautiful things about that mountain is in the winter and spring, it all turned green. We just see it all. Wow, it's green. But one day of summer, just one day, it all turned brown. And that never ceased to amaze me as a, as a little kid to see that. What can happen? It's kind of like people. How many famous people that were famous 100 years ago does anybody remember? It's all gone now. What are they? They're like withered, fallen, dried up grass. That's, that's the word of God trying to show us. We need something more that, that supersedes all that. <clears throat> In fact, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Amen, amen. Until heaven and earth disappear, until everything's gone, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So we have an assurance policy in God's word, and it's still alive today, and it is a miracle. That's why I often say this Bible is a miracle we can hold in our hands. And God has given us a hope, and he wants us to own it. So we have a new hope. Isaiah 40 then, verse 9, says this. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up and do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. This is good news. This is the gospel. Put it up on a billboard. Your God is here. We're not alone. If anyone is in Christ, they're not alone. No matter what the chaos appears in this world, you're not alone. It's a relationship. We have hope. And it's a new, revived hope in our hearts. And it will never pass away. It's eternity for us. It's a forever hope that will never disappear. It's a miracle. Then we also have a new king. Isaiah 40 verse 10 says this. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. His arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him. And his recompense accompanies him. You have to kind of read that slow to see all that's hidden in those three or four phrases. The, the coronavirus has lost its crown. We now bow to a new sovereignty. We have a new coronation. God crowns himself in our hearts. He rules and reigns in us. Three very important things. God is sovereign. S- meaning he's overall. There's nothing more powerful than God. He's gonna, he had the first word. He's going to have the last word. Second thing is this, God then rewards us, all believers, anybody who believes, with his presence. He is with us. The third thing is this, God has recompense. In other words, he'll recompensate us for our loss. And we all have those, different things in our lives. The healing, the redemption, the peace, the joy, we all probably have our own list. 
God will, will bring recompense in areas we never even anticipated through the power of his Holy Spirit. So we worship, we bow, we acknowledge, we serve. We, what we do is we lower ourselves and we raise up the King of Kings. We keep lowering ourselves and we raise him up. And we're really blessed to be able to call Jesus our King. What a coronation that is. No more self. No more me. No more me, dia. Me, dia. No more sick culture mediating for us. This world needs that king so bad if they only knew. Thank God we have a new mediator. Can you get a better mediator than Jesus Christ? What a blessing. Now, after all this display of power, now we have a display of gentleness. This last little verse, verse 11 in Isaiah 40, we have a new shepherd. Verse 11 says this, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart, and he gently leads those with young. Remember, Jesus made some I am proclamations in the book of John, and one of them was, I am the good shepherd. Who else in the world could stand in front of people and say that and actually make it true? He is the good shepherd. So all, all who belong to Jesus already are gathered in his arms. We're already gathered. And whoever belongs to Jesus now are being carried close to his heart. I remember years ago, it's hard to remember back that far, but I was a youth pastor, a very large church. And after five or six years of being a youth pastor, I just felt this urge to move on somehow, pastor a church, or I didn't know what to do. And it's hard to find a place to pray in that big church. There's people everywhere. And I remember finding a place in the back room, four or five levels up, up some stairs with all the tables and chairs stacked. And I'd pray there for about a year by myself. And I'd open up my Bible and pray and pray. And should I leave the church? What should I do? And I was so worried because my daughter was about three years old. My son was just born. My wife wasn't working because she had to take care of the kids. I just bought a new car. We have a mortgage. And you know, you know how it goes. You worry about stuff. And I, what am I going to do? Go, go into the middle of nowhere? And I was praying. I was paralyzed by, by fear, but I, but I was following God. I knew something was up. I didn't know. And I, I turned. I was praying. And I, I often open up the Bible and I pray. And I'm reading scripture as I pray. And I hit this verse on verse 11, this last phrase. And he gently leads those that have young as soon as I read that, all the fear dissipated. I knew I could say, I'm going to be leaving the church. That was over 30 years ago. I can't tell you how many miracles have happened since then, just many providential miracles. But God showed me how that is true. He gently leads it. Because people that have young need to be led differently. They can't just run the race. They ha things have to be different. So verse 11 then, we have the supernatural hope in this shepherd king. Verse 11 says this, he tends his flock, that's us, like a shepherd. Now, who invented the concept of the shepherd? How important are shepherds? I guess you could ask the sheep how important they are. I think David knew a few things about shepherding. He was a shepherd as a young lad. He grew up as a shepherd. He understood what it is to have a shepherd over him, God. And he ended up writing that shepherd psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. What a powerful psalm that is. He learned a few lessons. What does a shepherd do? Well, he tends his flock. It takes time. It takes care. Literally, in Hebrew, the word tending means shepherding. You can look that up. It is shepherding. Whose flock is God shepherding? He's shepherding his own flock. God is not going to leave us alone. He's tending us. He's with us. I mean, he's caring for us. Does it get any better than that? I mean, can it get any better? It cannot get any better. It's a miracle. Can you imagine a couple of sheep talking? And they're, they're talking back and forth. And one says, well, who's your shepherd? Well, my shepherd is the creator of the universe. And the other sheep would just stare in disbelief. That is fantastic. The God, the Lord of the universe, is our shepherd. Three things about this shepherd in verse 11. He gathers the lambs in his arms. It's very personal. He gathers the lambs. He doesn't leave it to somebody else. He gathers the lambs in his arms. It's a miracle. Message to this world, a 2G message. Get 
gathered. Allow God to gather you in his arms, the, the, the great shepherd. How many can he gather in his arms? I mean, how many, what's the limit? I mean, he's the creator of the universe. It's unlimited. The only thing limited is time. Time is short. Remember the thief on the cross only had a few seconds of life left. He gave his life to Jesus and all suddenly he, he, he was uh, gathered in the arms of God through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The second thing then, he carries them close to his heart. He does more than gather us. He carries us. He carries us. He rescues us. He redeems us. He helps us. Now, some often say the value of real estate is, can be summed up in three words. Location, location, location. And that is true. Now, if you're carried close to his heart, is there a better location? I can't think of a better location. What an environmental condition that is. Close. How close is close to the heart of God? Talk about climate change. You can't get any better climate than that. And here's the third thing. And then he gently leads those that have young. See, we're not walking lockstep in God with him beating us over the head, yelling at us. He's leading us gently according to our need. And we all have, we all have different needs. It's a customized need, a sensitized need. It's a leading day by day. We may feel like we're just a speck of dust in this universe. We might be, but God can look at us as if we were the only people on the face of this earth, and he's going to care for us. We have God's word that he notices us. We're more than a speck of dust. So no wonder we have Isaiah 40, which begins in these words, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Now, if you really look at that word comfort, it's two words, with fortification, comfort. We're, we're strengthened, comfort, comfort. And who's saying it? Your God is. And then it leads us to this last little section, verse 11. Here's what he does. He tends his flock like a shepherd. Does it get any better? We're not making this up. This is in God's word. Jesus is the good shepherd, a miracle for all who bow. The door is open. Please be encouraged in the midst of the chaos of this world. Let God's word encourage you. You belong to him. He is your shepherd. Put your hope, your faith, and trust in Jesus Christ. This is God's message of comfort that's still available for this world. It doesn't matter who wears the crown. If it's a virus or a human, let God put the crown in your heart and rule and reign in your life. Comfort, comfort my people straight from the word of God. What a miracle. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this comfort. that We've only looked at 11 verses. There's more verses to go in this chapter. We'll look at it next time, but we just pray, O oh Father, for the miracle of your comfort to be with us all, that, we, that we'll all know what it is to have that king over us, and we'll be strengthened and encouraged in this world. We pray that anyone that does not believe in you yet and doesn't quite understand this, they'll simply say yes to you, and suddenly the door will be open to belief, to trust, to faith, and they'll be born again in Christ and be, uh, belong to your kingdom forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.